You're listening to the ADHD Support Talk Radio Podcast. ADHD Support Talk is brought to you by addclasses.com. Visit www.addclasses.com and sign up for free webinars and online events today. Hello, and welcome back to ADHD Support Talk Radio. I'm your co-host, Lynn Idris, and as a productivity and ADHD coach, I help overwhelmed professionals reduce procrastination, improve their time management, and get more done with less effort so that they have more time and more energy for the things that matter most to them. So you guys know I am a woman with ADHD myself. So I have been where so many of my clients are and I've come out the other side, so to speak. I always say, you know, ADHD doesn't go away, but you sure can learn to live well with it. So I have experienced that state of constant chaos and underperformance and, you know, feeling unfulfilled. And it doesn't have to stay that way. I believe every single one of you here can share your own version of success And that's why we're here. So you can learn more about me and what I do and the programs and services I offer at www.coachingadvantages.com. But today I am excited to have with me Dr. David Pomeroy, and we're going to talk about ADHD and the downsides of foregoing treatment in a moment. So welcome, Dr. Pomeroy. Thank you very much, Lynn. It's an honor to be here. I'm glad, I'm glad to have you with us. We've chatted a few times and I, I kind of love your perspective and the way you look at things. And I think today's topic is an important one. But before we jump in, go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit about you, um, where they may be able to learn more. Okay. I'm a uh, board certified family physician. I have been in the practice of medicine almost 43 years. Uh, did 26 years in general family medicine, and in 2005, decided to specialize in just ADHD. So I've been doing this for 16 years, seen over 3,000 patients of all ages um, with ADHD, and I just thoroughly enjoy that kind, this kind of practice. And anything that happened, you know, more than six months ago is before now, but sometime (laughs) five or six years ago, I started doing uh, podcast ADHD focus, which is on webtalkradio.net or webtalkradio.com. And my goal in that, as it has been in my practice, is to dispel the myth information out there about ADHD, because there's a lot out in popular media that is not accurate or is very one sided. So it's important for not only people with ADHD to know, but also those without to have a a way of looking at that. Absolutely. It's a very important mission, a very important mission. Before I started the recording, you and I were talking about what you kind of framed as the tripod of ADHD treatment. So if you go Mm -hmm. ahead and if you could explain that for us. Okay. I, I think there are basically three important legs of supporting the best, most optimal outcomes in ADHD. The first is lifestyle. And number one there is whatever it takes to make sure you get enough sleep and enough is at least seven and better as eight and kids, eight is the floor and more is better. So sleep is number one. You can't make up for lack of sleep by taking more medication, for instance. Um, Number two is exercise and more exercise or intentional physical activity, then better you can sleep and eating well and good nutrition. Uh, The second leg is strategies, different things like keeping a calendar, looking at your calendar, having reminders, um, having helper support in planning, talking with a coach talking with a professional organizer, um, whatever it takes to help your life go more smoothly, but you need those strategies. And the third one is medication. You can't do without any one of them. So medication benefits about 80% of people who take it to choose to. Uh, Not everybody, but most people get fairly good benefit from it. And there are a number of risks of not using medications, which are not usually seen or talked about in popular media. Um, 
And some of the things that are talked about as risks really aren't as big as you'd think. For instance, addiction is the one thing that most people think of as, oh, you can get addicted to these drugs. Yes, if you don't have ADHD, you can. Um, so they have put warnings on it that this is possible. People with that ADHD feel great. They feel energized. Everything's super. That effect wears off fairly quickly over maybe a month or so. But if I take two of them, I can get that. So they're always chasing that feeling. Absolutely. People with ADHD take it. Their, their mind quiets down. They can concentrate on things. They take more than that. It doesn't feel good. No, there's no incentive to keep going. Right. So I have not seen someone who truly has ADHD appropriately diagnosed become addicted to medication. Yes, if you are taking it for years and you suddenly stop, you aren't going to feel good. That's not the definition of addiction. Addiction right. is looking for more and more and more. People with ADD just want to get back to level. Being able to function. Right. Being able right. to perform in the way that they're capable of performing more consistently. And it's and it's tough because there is so much misinformation out there. I, I hear mm -hmm. it a lot um, from parents to other adults to I mean, I, I hear it a lot. We see it on the media and there is mm -hmm. there is significant abuse in the non ADHD population. I mean, you hear mm -hmm. all about it on college campuses and young adults and yep, high schools absolutely. and kids selling their ADHD medication to other kids or other kids abusing it or otherwise, but taken properly, taken as prescribed, taken consistently when you need it and you have ADHD. I mean, the risks mm -hmm. of, of addiction are like pr practically non-existent as far as I know. Yes. The risks of addiction to other substances is far greater if you're not med medicated. Yes. So research has shown this for a long time, that the risk of substance use and substance use disorders addiction is much higher in the untreated ADHD population than it is in the rest of the population, and much, much higher in the untreated ADHD population than it is in the treated ADHD population. Yes, yes. It, there's from a number of different studies and in, in not just the United States, but other countries as well, it's three to five times higher the number of teenagers wow. with substance abuse than the neurotypical population. And that comes down to baseline rates for everyone else when mm -hmm. a person is treated with medication. So it makes a a huge difference. Many of the other risks that, that uh, things that happen more often with people with ADHD, unintentional injuries as children, poisonings, um, something like 15% of kids with ADHD have four or more serious injuries, broken bones, head trauma, major lacerations, and those are less with with treatment wow it, motor vehicle accidents car accidents two to four times the rate in people with adhd untreated wow and people with ad we we think we're and i say we because i also have adhd we think we're good drivers <laughs> we aren't <laughs> right um, and it's not it's not the obvious thing of you know you're looking around the back seat to find something or you're tuning the radio I, my belief is that our thoughts get going somewhere yeah. else. Let me hear on the radio, let me just have to think of. And so we're going along looking, but not really seeing and thinking about what we're looking about. So again, those rates decrease in terms of accidents, do all the various measurement things for how well someone's driving. Those come back to neurotypical levels with medication. And that's, and that's something to pay attention to, I think, um, you know, obviously as a parent, but as an adult as well, right? I mean, I know, <laughs> I was kind of giggling as you said that. I mean, I, I think of myself as a very good driver. I think probably everybody thinks they're a good driver, right? Just, you know, we're not always the best self-observers. Um, but yeah. I know my, my, my worst driving, my most problematic driving in terms of like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just kind of, kind of focus and alertness 
is when I'm, you know, driving on roads that I drive on all the time. And I can't remember, I saw somewhere this a statistic about, you know, the number of accidents that happen within a per, the five mile radius of the person's yeah. house and that's, is significantly that's for, higher yeah, for everybody. everybody. But the flake out sort of factor is so much higher for us, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. thoughts come quickly, um, especially when you're not taking your medication. They're yeah. they're harder to regulate, right? They're harder to filter. And it's it's really easy to all of a sudden be somewhere and think to yourself, and I think most of our listeners can relate to this, and think to yourself, gosh, I hope those lights were green. <laughs> or or, or yeah. I hope yeah. I didn't, you know. I didn't do it. Right. I've, I've just totally been in my head or in a song or, you know, somewhere else as I've been driving. And it's, it's, you know, it is a little bit scary sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll be going down a road or a set of roads that I do all the time, mm -hmm. but I'm really going somewhere else. So I need to take a different turn. And I find myself where I usually go and thinking, oh yeah, I would, no, I was supposed to be here. And somewhere else. Um, One of those oh crap just, moments, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We go on automatic yep. and there isn't thinking about it because, oh, I've done this before. Absolutely. And you don't see the taillights of the car, two cars ahead. Mm -hmm. And they stop because there's a pedestrian that you can't mm -hmm. see. And you expect traffic's just going to keep going. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of things that we don't realize are happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk a little more about what are some of the risk factors for, for foregoing medical treatment when you have ADHD? One of the things that, that to me, I think is the most, most concerning is in younger children, but it's true in adults and teenagers is too, is the negative self-image they develop when everybody says, how come you can't do this? You aren't mm -hmm. trying hard enough. You're mm -hmm. lazy. Um, you don't want to obey. Um, you're getting angry all the time. And no child wakes up and thinks, how can I screw up today? Right. How can I really mess up my teacher's life today? Right. How, how can, can I, I really piss my parents off? Right. How can I let exactly. people down? Right. Yeah. And when they get messages all the time of you aren't measuring up, you tend to internalize, I'm not good. Yeah. Not just that my behavior isn't right. And that leads to shame. Well, people with shame, um, thanks to Brene Brown and, and a lot of her research on it, she says people who feel ashamed react in usually one of two ways escape or attack. Mm -hmm. Escape is drug abuse, fantasy, video games, those kinds of things. I can escape the way I feel and I'm feeling getting some reward right away or attack. And for young kids, this is acting out their feelings. They aren't acting as in something they choose to do. A six-year-old can't put into words how they're feeling about you know, the fact that they lost their gloves again or whatever mm -hmm. and getting criticized, but they sure can get angry about it. So then they get labeled as disruptive and a troublemaker right. and blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's paying attention to the feeling, what, what's going on behind the action, um, the feelings there. And so what happens is for People who internalize all that is much higher rates of anxiety and depression. Yep. And those may not be as visible in younger children, but they can show up more as teenagers or adults. Mm -hmm. um, or in younger children, depression can show up as being irritable. Right. Because they can't figure out they get helpless. And then the major concern is teenagers there's a much higher rate of suicide. Absolutely. Thinking about suicide and committing suicide. Because you add the, I'm feeling down, I'm helpless, and impulsiveness. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a dangerous combination. Um, terrifying, now, absolutely. Medication isn't going to fix the depression or anxiety that's there. 
but it's going to help a child feel more in control. I can do this. Mm-hmm. It's possible for me to study and do well on this test or remember what the coach said when I'm playing baseball and I'm supposed to do this or that and not be criticized for talking too much or whatever. So there's more opportunity for success. Yeah. It's, it's hard, right? Most of the, you know, I work exclusively, exclusively with adults and, you know, I think almost every single person that's ever come to me for help, a bit, one of the big obstacles in their way, one of the biggest obstacles in their way of living that fulfilling life that they want is that shame. It's that blame and that shame and that cycle. And that starts really early on. Right. Yeah. So, you know, medication is, it can be an important tool. You talk about the tripod, Mm -hmm. you know, we have an expression in coaching that says, you know, many people have heard this before pills don't teach skills. I always say, you know, you've got to learn how to do things differently. You've got to learn new skills. You've got to learn new ways of approaching the things, how you work best, what you need to have in place to be Mm -hmm. successful. You've got to create that scaffolding around you that supports you and helps you show up in the way you're capable but medication can be a really important tool in your toolbox. It's one of many, but it absolutely can be for a lot of my clients. It can make the difference between them being able to focus sufficiently to learn, to do things differently, more easily or not. Right. Pills don't teach the skills, but you certainly can learn the skills a lot better. Absolutely. Absolutely. It can make it much easier. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, one of the things we were talking about earlier, and it's one of the things I hear a lot from clients is I don't want to take medication for the rest of my life. I don't want to need medication. I don't think anybody wants to need medication of any kind, right? My grandmother was diabetic. I, she did not want to need her insulin. She did not want to need the medication that she took every day. I don't want to need contact lenses, (laughs) but I'm blind to bat without them. Right. If it's something that's going to help you perform better, if it's something that's going to help Mm -hmm. you and your quality of life, I mean, it's, it really is something to really pay attention to how you're thinking about it. Yeah. And the, the, again, this is the the risks that people can't look forward when you're 12 and your parents and you can't look at, okay, what's, what life is going to be like for you when you're 25 or when you're 40? Well, if you haven't been treated, taking medication, doing other things for ADD, you're much more likely to have a drug problem mm-hmm. or not graduate from high school, not even go to college, have lower paying jobs, more relationship issues, multiple jobs because you're getting fired. And basically your quality of life is much lower and higher risk of obesity and other problems that lead to a shorter life expectancy. People with ADHD on average do not live as long as people without it. So this is the inability to see because can't predict the future, but we know from observations of people over time that this happens and measurements and everything, uh, studies show that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, you know, we were talking a little bit before we recorded as well. We chatted it up a bit. I am a mom of a young man with ADHD. He's 26 now and he's in in grad school. But I remember when he was little, even with my background in psychology and human development and everything, I did not want medication was a last resort for me with him. I really needed to try all of the behavioral stuff and lots Mm -hmm. of other things before I got to the point where I was okay with that. And that's one of the things I think that is a common misperception is that, you know, parents just want to medicate their kids so that they don't have to deal with them or schools want to medicate their kids so that they don't have to deal with them or so they, they don't have to parent them or, you know, teach them or whatever. I really have seen over all my years of, of, you know, doing this and working with parents and working with other adults, that that is very rarely, if ever the case, Mm -hmm. parents are afraid, parents are resistant, you know, parents are want to know more. Um, parents don't feel good about giving their medica- their children medication a lot of the time. So we really need to make sure we're, we're educated about this. 
and they may feel guilty that absolutely they caused some part of it or they're being a bad parent because right. they're giving in that's part of the messages that are coming out. Absolutely. Of you, you should be able to control your child. Absolutely. The, I think a um, very interesting observation that came out of a very large study back in 1999 to 2000 called the MTA uh, mm -hmm. study. That's at least the acronym for it. Um, and it was a large study done in multiple areas in the country very controlled as far as kids getting medication, kids having behavioral um, approaches, kids having both of those, and just kind of whatever they got in the community. And dosages were optimized, people were reminded, all those kinds of things. And people, kids taking medications alone and medications plus behavioral mm -hmm. get better. Um, behavioral helped like 20, I think 20 to 40% and the two together, 60 some percent. But over all of those different kind of treatment areas, the kids who did best in all of them had loving, supportive family. Yeah. That was key. So I think it's tempting for parents to want to have a child that fits their expectations. Parent the child you have. Yeah, the one you wish you had. Absolutely. Support that Absolutely. Child and believe that they're trying to do their best. I think that's that's the most important thing. Absolutely. It's hard. And and for those of you who are listening who are parents of younger children, you know, been there, done that. It, it's really hard, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they they don't come with manuals. I was AD, even with my ADHD, I was a pretty easy, pretty chill kid. I think my mom would agree to that, especially in the younger years. So when I, my firstborn was this little, you know, energizer bunny that I, you know, I, I didn't have any idea how to, how to parent him because I, my parents had, I had never been parented that way. So there was a lot in the beginning in those early years of I'm, I'm not doing it right. Um, you yeah. know, let's try this behavioral intervention. Let's try this reward system. And all of those things were helpful in some way, but it wasn't until I could really step back and look at it a little bit more objectively and realize that it really wasn't about me. It was about him and what was best for him. And, um, you know, he really needed like all three prongs, right? Mm -hmm. All three, all three legs of the tripod. I mean, that's yep. we, and most people do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this is an important conversation to have. It's, it's important for us to, to educate ourselves about treatment options. It's important for us to educate ourselves about medication. It's Im also important. And, um, you know, you might have some thoughts on this. I'd love them if you could share to really make sure that the medication that you're taking, that it, it's optimized for you. There are yes. so many options out there anymore. Um, and so many different things that you can try and combinations of things that if you work with a knowledgeable physician, it, it, the odds of finding something that could really be helpful and supportive for you, a really helpful tool in your tool belt can be increased dramatically. But I do find that a lot of my clients, and I think this is true kind of in general, their medication is not optimized. Yeah. Or they try one, it doesn't work. And they say, well, see, medicine isn't going to work. Right. Well, um, it like so many things, just one, one approach doesn't mean that other options in, in medication, particularly isn't going to work. You know, two major families, amphetamines and the methylphenidates, Ritalin mm -hmm. kind, some work better for some people and they just don't work or people have side effects to the other one. Absolutely. So there's a 50% chance of finding the right one just to start with. The unique thing about these though is once you take that day, you see the result that day. Yes. You take some and you get a side effect. Don't take it the next day. You don't have it. Yeah. You get a splitting headache every time it wears off in the afternoon. Stop taking it. And there are other options. And it takes, yeah, tweaking. This one works great for eight hours, but nobody has only an eight hour day. Okay. How do you right. extend that some with something that isn't going to get in the way of sleep? There all kinds of varieties, but it, um, there's there's a way to make it work for at least eighty percent of people. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So working with a physician who listens to you, working with a physician who's knowledgeable and willing to try some different things. And sometimes that's a hard thing to find, but I, mm-hmm. I've had plenty of clients over the years who um, some of us are much more sensitive to certain things yeah. than others are. Like my son was a very fast metabolizer, but he was also very sensitive to certain things. So he could take some medications in one family and not others. I've had clients, mm-hmm. um, you know, certain generics will impact them and oh yeah, uh, and some will be more helpful than others. I mean, it really, there are so many options. Just and- unilaterally deciding medication doesn't work for me, you know, unless you have some other, you know, contraindication, work with your doctor, yeah. see what you can work. find, see what you can do to get a, get the coverage and, and to get the help that you need, because it really can make a big difference. Um, yeah, I was asked a number of years ago in a, another podcast situation that um, person asked me, well, what do you, what do you say to your doctor who says they don't believe in ADHD? Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Have a good day. Right. Convince them. No, and they certainly aren't going to give you optimal treatment, find someone else. And yeah, it is difficult to find people who are expert in it. Um, Psychiatric nurse practitioners are well-trained. Absolutely. um, In all kinds of psychiatric things and ADHD, developmental pediatricians, family physicians, Mm -hmm. psychiatrists. um, And yet in any one of their groups, they're going to be clinicians that don't believe in it or are scared of using stimulants mm-hmm. themselves and in, in terms of prescribing them. So they'll try one and well, it didn't work. So you must not have ADD. <laughs> they don't understand all the things about it. Absolutely. And it's not a diagnostic tool. That's another thing I always want to yes, remind people. Absolutely. <laughs> Just because yeah. it helped or didn't help is not an indication for certain one way or another, absolutely, of whether you yes. have ADHD. Good stuff. I think, again, I think this is a really important conversation to have. I think it's an important thing for people to hear. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and I, 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 as you and I talked about earlier, I mean, I think it's a very personal decision. I think it's a very personal choice, um, whether you're an adult or whether you're making this decision on behalf of um, a child that you parent. It's not an easy decision for most of us, but it's a decision to make with the right education and the right information behind you. Mm -hmm. And I, and the risk of taking medication and having serious side effects is very, very low because you can try it a day or two. And if it doesn't work, you feel terrible or your pulse is going too fast and you feel shaky, don't take it. Wears off, those are going to be gone. So uh, it's not um, something that has a risk to at least try it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any last thoughts you want to share with our listeners? I guess that that mainly is don't, don't be afraid of trying stimulant medication because there are major risks to not doing it. Yeah. Um, And those are very real. You need to be aware of it. You can choose to go down a different path and end up on that one. Absolutely. Uh, And I try to uh, give people education about ADHD, much as you do on my podcast, ADHD Focus. So I welcome uh, any listeners to learn other aspects of it. Awesome. You're, you're a, you're a very, very helpful resource and guys talk to your physicians, right? If, if simulant medication is a is not an option for you for some medical reason or, or whatever. There are so many options out there these days, yep. really. Yep. Um, and a knowledgeable doctor and someone who will listen to you is really very much worth their weight in gold. So keep, you know, don't, don't settle. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Pomeroy. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for listening. As always, I appreciate your attention. Um, Join us in the ADHD Support Talk Facebook group if you want to connect, share your thoughts, have questions or ideas for guests or topics you'd like us to cover. And uh, as always, as I say, I do appreciate your attention. I appreciate you all being here. Thanks again, Dr. Pomeroy, and we will catch you next time. You're welcome.